Perfect. Um, can you introduce yourself with your name, title, company, and your role? Absolutely. My name is Andrea Nelson. Happy to be here. Uh, I am the VP of product at Motional. Perfect. Um, and Glow already did her introduction, so we'll start off with your presentation, Andrea. All right. I'll right. get going here, sharing some slides. So I'm, I'm really excited to be here sharing some content with Startup Boston. Uh, the content I put together today is really what I would consider my personal blueprint for building amazing things. I'm hoping that <clears throat> you can either get out of this some tips or tricks to build your own team or some insights to look for when, uh, when you're looking to join a team. So to get started, I would say the number one thing the number one I look at when I'm building a team is how big is the company? And that usually points to the stage the company is in. So you've noticed here, I, I have not only the size in terms of number of employees, but also the, the phase of the company. So a startup would be less than 100 people. A young company would be roughly 1,000. Medium established, 1,000 to 10,000. And then large would be 10,000 plus. So I have personally worked at uh, every stage of, of, of the company uh, and built teams at every stage. Uh, and, and at each stage, at each size, I would say the needs for each uh, are slightly different. Uh, and so building a team has slightly different constraints. So what I'm going to do quickly is just to go through some examples um, from my personal experience. So startup team building. As I mentioned, startups tend to be quite small. Um, tech companies, so I, I'll focus mostly on tech companies because that is my personal experience, but I, I imagine this could be applicable to companies that are outside of tech as well. Um, small tech companies usually have very small product teams. Um, if you're at a company that's uh, a dozen people, it's likely just a single person that is the product team. Uh, additionally, typically at small tech companies, the product roles are fungible and everyone wears multiple hats. So a single person could be doing every single one of the roles that I've listed here. Uh, or you could have a team of say three to five people where they're either doing uh, a, a handful of these things or everyone is doing everything. Um, it really depends on the particular organization. I would say that typically everyone working at a small a uh, startup company is a climber, meaning they have a, a real thirst for growth, and that aids them in being able to wear multiple hats. So they are typically junior or mid-level, uh, what I would consider generalists. So they are either new to some of these roles, um, they've done some of these in the past and exploring some others, or they just love being generals. They love doing everything um, themselves. Typically, startups focus on hiring junior and mid-level um, generalists for two reasons. One, they really do need people that can fill all of these roles. And two, the experts and specialists are typically much more expensive. And there's really no need uh, at, at the, the young stage to have those types of individuals yet. So going on to young company teams, uh, and feel free to interrupt if there are questions, but uh, young company teams um, tend to have a slightly larger product team. So it really depends on the size and the stage of the company. Um, but And the product roles are likely still fungible depending on the teams, but usually the roles that I've listed here will also have specialists as the companies get large enough. Uh, typically, this is still going to be a team of climbers, so you would still be hiring people that can do multiple roles if the need arises. And again, still junior or mid-level uh, individuals because as the market changes, needs changes and people need to adapt quickly. So um, I have actually put an icon here for the company I work for currently, but this is just one specific example. Um, I would say a lot of 
uh, young companies have similar problems uh, and really their strategy and staffing team depends on their particular goals as an organization, whether they're in a nascent market like Emotional is in the autonomous vehicle space or if they're in an established market, um, but still a, a young company themselves. On medium established teams, I would say the product team size is now at a stage where it's proportional to the, both the portfolio and the engineering teams, where the product roles can be much more established. So you have more specialists for specific areas like marketing, design, uh, analytics, and specific teams um, for those different roles as well. Here in this established medium-sized company realm, the need is really shifting from that junior um, generalist um, speciality, right, to a, a more of a, a mix of junior, mid-level, senior, both specialists and generalists, both ICs and managers. This is really where you see a lot of these different types of teams coming together. I will also say that um, folks that start at a startup level and stay with a company until they get to this medium um, level sometimes tend to leave at this point because they're not really as valued as the generalist and you see more value being put on specialists. So you see at this stage or sometimes um, the prior slide stage, you also see some of that turnover as the company is, is maturing more and more. But I would say this is really the point where working at a company like this, I would build a team with a really homogeneous mix of all different kinds of levels um, and specialities. And then the large companies are, uh, I would say, where the teams are the most homogeneous. Um, and so it's the same strategy as meeting companies, but the roles and responsibilities are much more established. The processes, the processes are established everyone is really a specialist at this point um, with, you know, if you, if there are individuals with a generalist background, um, they tend to focus on moving around within the company to different roles uh, and growth and upward mobility is, I would say, typically measured in years of service rather than competencies and business needs. So at uh, at the younger companies, it tends to be junior people because they're looking at building a career based on the experiences they have and the roles that they're, you know, covering. Whereas at a larger company, I have here listed Amazon is, is one of the largest companies. Really, it's just how long have you been there? How well do you know the company? And that is seen as your measure of expertise, if you will. So across all of these different types of companies and different stages, I would say the qualities that I would look for in every hire at every stage really is adaptability, the ability to communicate and compassion. There really is no stage of a company where those three things aren't going to make for a really important addition to a product team. The adaptability, as I mentioned, at, at large companies, you have a lot of specialists but adaptability even at the specialist level can be really important um, as goals change, as economies shift, as markets change. Communication, the ability to communicate is, is a number one criteria for a product manager. And then compassion. I, I can't say this enough, but a, the ability to form a, a family out of a team of people and really have you know, if you have a situation where you're working under stress to be able to have compassion for the people that you work with is, is one of the most important things I've seen at companies. So Julie, that wraps up the lightning talk. I can stop sharing my content and then uh, we can answer any questions if there are any. Perfect, thank you so much, Andrea. Um, any questions from the audience for Andrea on either her career and or the topics that she's presented today? Yes. Sure. So you talked about uh, a lot of within the team. You didn't talk as much about the empathy for the user of the product. So is that just assumed if 
people are in product, or, or what role does that play in choosing them, uh, choosing the students? So I've heard part of that question. Do you think you could repeat it? All right, here yeah. you are. Uh, she's going to rephrase or uh, repeat the question. Sure. Uh, just wanted your perspective on choosing the team from the point of view of users. So a lot of what you talked about was sort of internal and how team talks to each other. But what sort of I expected when you said compassion, it was about empathy for the user. So I just love that perspective from your point of view. Maybe it's the same across sizes of teams, but uh, I'd love that point of view. Yeah, no, that's really great. Um, I would say in, in terms of um, communication or compassion toward the user, it really does, um, I, I think that is applicable at all stages. I, I would say the difference between the earlier stages uh, and the later stages, um, earlier stages, you tend to have need um, a much larger sense of I, what I would call curiosity uh, Curiosity is equal at all stages, but especially at the young stages, you really need to have that thirst for knowledge. In established companies, typically the user is much better understood already. And so there's already existing data. It's much easier to jump in and already understand what's going on. Whereas at a new company, especially in a, in a nascent market, it's it, you really have to want to dig in and understand and put yourself in multiple people's shoes. Uh, I did see that there was one more question in the audience there. One oh, moment. Two more. Hi. Um, I have maybe just more of a, a comment. Maybe you can react to it. But at, at, with small companies, often the founder tends to be the CPO de facto. Um, that they're the head of product. And then you know any additional product people are... are Maybe not the you know expected to kind of lead the product. And how does how do you see that? Do you react to that? You say you're nodding, say that that's true. And how does that evolve in your mind as the company grows? I would say, um, yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. Um, in my experience, that does not work well for very long. So uh, the founders of startups, right? There is the the the. I would say the innovative phase where they want to be involved in all aspects of creation. And anytime a startup goes from, let's say a dozen people to more than that, they should very, very quickly hire people that they trust to do all of those functions and to very quickly remove themselves. That transition from founder to CEO is a very difficult one for a lot of people because they can't kind of let go and let other people lead. Um, and the longer they hang on to those things, the more challenging it becomes as an organization. Is we'll take question? one final question um, from the gentleman. I guess I'm just curious how you interview for compassion. How do you assess that in an interview, especially at more junior levels? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. Um, I would. It really is asking questions about how individuals have handled certain situations. I typically like to ask how people handle what I would consider difficult personalities. You can tell a lot about someone, um, whether they, by the way that they talk about other people, whether they talk about other people as this, you know, very general personality archetype, or if they can identify with certain aspects of that personal's life or personality and still deal with what they're, you know, even if it's a difficult situation, if they can still identify with those parts and say, well, you know, this was a difficult situation, but I understood that this person was going through some things on the side. And, you know, you, you can tell a lot about asking um, individuals to go through very specific scenarios. Awesome, thank you so much, Andrea. A round of applause for Andrea. Great, now we will move on to the next speaker, Glow Robinson. <clears throat> Where are my slides? I might have access to them on my end. Let's go to here. 
those are the only slides that we have. I sent in my slides. Yeah. yeah. Um, one moment. Yeah. Julie, can you see? I'm, I'm sharing Lowe's deck. Can you see? Thank you. All right. I'll just uh, tell you when to move to the next. Um, Perfect. To the next one. Thank you so much, Andrea. I really appreciate it. All right. So hi, my name is Glow Robinson. Um, I am currently a product manager at Warner Brothers Discovery, but you're probably wondering why someone in corporate here at a startup conference. I was a founder and then I consulted for early stage startups before taking this job. So if we want to go to the next slide, that'd be great. All right, so I decided to make myself a persona. Um, I'm probably somewhere in many people's marketing marketing decks on terms of who they're trying to target to because I do think I am a little bit of a stereotype. I live in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. I love Patagonia. I do go to Sweetgreen occasionally. I love Trader Joe's. Um, and I like to go hiking when I'm not stuck in the corporate the not corporate metop metropolis, but just New York is a little bit of a corporate jungle, so I like to get out occasionally. A um, couple hot takes. I think Anthropic is better than ChatGPT. Coda is my favorite product documentation software. I think it's better than Notion. I will die on this hill. And if you're, if you're ready to get rid of Chrome, Arc is a much better browser. Um, so those are a few fun facts about me. All right, we can go to the next slide. So I thought for this presentation, it would be fun to make my career like a roadmap. So, so far in my career, I've done three sprints. We've done the glow as a founder. Then when I ended my company, I really wasn't sure what I wanted to do with my life. So I decided to consult for early stage startups because that's what I knew how to do. I was like, yeah, I can make ideas into reality. How do we do that? And I think for me at the time, it was I, when I ended my company, I felt really, really lost because I was just like, gosh, I had poured my entire heart and soul into building out this idea and building a team and thinking this was the future. But what was really interesting is I started mentoring and volunteering at um, early stage startup accelerators like Techstars or Mass Challenge. And what I noticed is there was a lot of people kind of adding on to Andrea's point that were coming from big companies that wanted to start small companies or startups. And the value proposition I was able to offer was, oh, I know this the other way around. I've never worked at a big company, but I understand like, how do we you know, validate something? How do we test something? Um, and so that actually ended up becoming my full-time job and I freelanced for about a year, year and a half. Um, and then one of my clients introduced me to a product manager that knew of a team that was hiring at WBD in the New York office. And I interviewed with them and I decided to take the plunge. But before we get to all that, let's go to the next slide and I'll explain my breakdown times of my three phases. So what I thought would be really helpful is I think a lot of times we have this perception of, oh, when you're a founder, this is what your job is. Or, oh, if you're a freelancer, this is what your job is. Or, oh, if you work in corporate, this is what your job is. But I really took the time to sit and think about, well, how much time did I actually spend building? How much time did I deal? How much time did I network? How much time did I actually have to do people HR stuff? So when I did the analysis of my breakdown as a, as a founder is I noticed that, you know, I didn't, as the company scaled and grew, we, we grew to about 20 people. I became less and less involved. I became less and less involved with the actual day-to-day -day of building things. And so I think one of the other points is kind of getting back to that whole factor of, oh, the founder's the CPO. If you want to be a good CEO, you have to realize that, yeah, someone else is going to take those things on. And as your company grows and scales, your day to days are you're kind of like you're like a czar and you're like, oh, if the software is down, I got to go work with the software team or, oh, for having a marketing problem, I have to go solve that. And then but when I ended my company, I realized I was like, what out of all those things that I like doing the most? And for me, it was product. I love the idea of product management. I love the idea of building stuff. And I love the idea of taking ideas and making them into reality. I could not stand the operations part. I couldn't stand the HR stuff. Finances, legal. Oh, gosh, get that away. But in order to be a really good founder or CEO, you have to be willing to give that up and take on things that you're not necessarily going to want to do on a daily basis. And even though I might sound a little selfish saying that, I would rather... I, I, I came to the conclusion that it just made more sense for me at this time to be like, well, why don't I just find jobs that are more product facing where the day to day, even though there are administrative stuff with any job, was a lot lighter than, oh, I'm just going to go start another company and build something. Then when I took my job in corporate, 
what I realized is a lot of my time is actually dealing with stakeholders and it's more of a stakeholder management where essentially you get assigned, you know, um, products or tasks from the roadmap that the executives figure out about, oh, we're going to launch this and we're going to launch that. And then you get assigned one of those things. But really, you're almost kind of like a politician because you're trying to get buy in from different teams and say why your product needs more resourcing or why your product needs to make the roadmap or why you need to why the engineers need to meet this deadline. And your job actually becomes more in terms of a communication aspect, at least at the product level. Um, and we'll get down. We'll, we'll talk, I'll talk a little bit about like sort of the product track. Um, within larger companies. But in terms of the building time, that does take up time as well. But really, I would say the big difference is as a founder, it does change in the size of your company. When you're first starting out, yeah, it's the, it's the best part. You're like building stuff. It's really exciting. But then as soon as you grow and scale to like 10 people, you your time starts to become really divided where you're like, well, I can't really focus on any one thing. And if I do, then everything else becomes lopsided. Then as a consultant, your job, I ended up finding myself networking and thinking of more thought leadership stuff. Well, what makes me different in terms of how I solve problems? And so a lot of the client, it was really about not only just doing the client work, but a lot of my time was how do I sell the client work that I've done and show why it was great or why it was competent, so to speak. Um, and then again, corporate was just more about, um, I would say, at, at the stage where I'm at at the company is more about stakeholder management and trying to get buy-in about the products that I'm building. We can go to the next slide. Okay, so uh, I've told a lot of people, um, my friends who are probably tuning in right now, that my 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 slides uh, feature motorcycles and minivans. So the biggest difference between startups and corporates, in my personal opinion, is that startups are like bad boys. You get to try everything. It's the most exciting feeling in the world. Um, and then when you pivot, you're just going a different direction. And at least you're trying something new because you don't have to get all this approval from the VP and then the SVP and from the head of engineering about why you should, why this should or shouldn't be built. No, the best part is you just go ahead and build it. If you decide we're a product company and we're going to decide to change our target, target ICP, great. You don't need approval for that. So that's why you can at least go in a different direction. With corporates, what I've come to notice is that we might be we might be innovative, but we keep going in circles where we might get all this buy-in and everyone's really excited, but there's one person that's the road blocker. And then the product doesn't become so hot and then it kind of dies down. But then someone else out of the woodwork, hey, I heard about this, let's revive it again. And then you just end up going in circles and in circles and in circles. Does anyone relate to that who's worked in corporate before? Yes. And so in terms of the pace, the reason why I compare motorcycles to minivans is you're still building, but the rate of you actually shipping something is so much slower and takes so much more inertia than with a motorcycle where you can just go. All right, we'll go to the next slide. Okay, so the interview process. Uh, what actually matters? Very simply speaking, startups is, can you get me those numbers? Can we get to that next funding round? With corporates is, can you play nicely with others? Kind of getting back to that level of compassion. Yes, of course, everybody would like to have compassionate people, but the the needs of the business are a little different. Where startups, you think you know, there's high turnover rates. It's like, yeah, great, we got to this next number, we hit product market fit, cool. Like, yes, it might be sad if that person leaves, but if they were the person that helps get to product market fit, they might be really good at from getting from zero to product market fit. But then after that, it's okay if they leave. In corporates, it's a lot more expensive when someone's let go and having to maintain the turnover because we have such bigger and higher scaled issues. So what's crazy is think about it this way. In a small company, you know, like let's let's think of something as simple as like resetting a password, right? Like that might just be one of many things, many features that you're working on as a product manager. But at corporate, there's probably one product manager that is responsible entirely for that because we're dealing with millions and millions of users. And so the scaling and the UAT and the um, utility value of that is, is significant. And so what I would say with the interview process is I interviewed, I've interviewed at several startups, like mid to mid stage, like for senior PM roles or even heads of roles. And then when I interviewed at corporate, the big difference was, is from my perspective, at least I've, transparently, I've only interviewed at one corporate company, which is this one, is there was a lot more vibe checking going on, I would say, in the corporate spaces. They really wanted to know, how are you going to work with others? Like one of my colleagues interviewed me and said, what's your favorite show on HBO? Literally five. And I was like, thank God I said Succession because he likes Succession too. 
Um, <laughs> yes, clearly that's why I got my job. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but in terms of the the numbers part, the at least at the at the Series B startups that I was interviewing at, it seemed like it was really like this critical time. Hey, we're trying to raise our Series C. What has your track record been like? We don't want to take a chance on someone that hasn't done it, especially in the product roles, especially when you're building out that first team where a product a head of products able to. Um, hire and be and create more of a group product management situation. They really care about have you done this before? Have we we don't want to we don't want to take a chance on you. But in corporates, if you're like, hey, I want to break into product management, no one wants. It's hard to be someone that's never done product management before interviewing for it. But at least with that, there's room to grow and there's a lot enough enough. Um, I don't know what the word is, but uh, support that you can try out a few more things and grow in into the role a little bit more and it won't be costly. We can go to the next slide. All right, so another thing to kind of just give a little bit of context is the hierarchy of needs of a company. What's the difference between startups and corporates? In a lot of ways, they're really similar, but the scale is probably the biggest part. So at the top, we can see, I would say both companies care the most about customer acquisition cost. How do we reduce that? Get new customers. In terms of where things sit, marketing and sales. Marketing and sales responsibilities is probably where that's going to sit, but also they're probably the first to get cut. Then we have growth, which is for, um, for big companies like WBD, we really care about market share. We really want to be number one. We, when you want to watch content, we want to be the first place that you think of. For startups, it's achieving product market fit and then eventually growing into the idea of, I want to take actual market share of the space. Um, and so then you're going to start to see roles for product, sales, um, and marketing as well. But then retention is at the bottom or life, customer lifetime value, which is really where the product and engineering people sit. And they're probably the last to get cut. But the difference is uh, corporates really care about the stock price if they're, if they're public. And, the, and startups really care about the funding round. Like as in, and so in terms of where their priorities lie, this is how we make money. This is how we gain market share. This is how we get customers. Those, and so, yeah, if we can move on to the next slide, I'm realizing I'm taking everything over here. Okay, so I thought it would be really helpful. Um, this is a diagram by Melissa Perry. She's an incredible product thought leader um, where she kind of outlines sort of the different, the way that you spend time throughout the levels in product management throughout a larger organization. What I wanted to do was specify for product managers specifically as at a corporate versus a startup, actually the difference of how you're spending your time. Because the biggest thing is that in a startup, you're able to get more hands-on with strategy and a lot less on the operational side. If you want to learn about operations, go work at a bigger company. If you, are, if you hate operations, go work at a startup so to speak. And I would say the biggest difference is that in a corporate PM, there's a lot more tactical things involved where you're being told what to build, as opposed to at a startup where you can almost decide what to build. In terms of, again, if we go back to that example of, hey, we want to change our target ICP. I don't need to get all those approvals on an early stage startup because it's 10 people. But if I want to try something, even run an experiment, it is a very procedural process. It's like going, it's like trying to get a doctor's appointment with your healthcare provider. That is how slow, that is how slow it is in corporate America, at least from my personal experience. All right, we can go to the next slide. So this kind of hits at some of the punchline here. I think what I've noticed is when I've talked to a lot of people that say they want to break into product management or just any job in general and make some sort of pivot is what do I want versus what do I need? And so the thing is, a lot of times I think, especially on TikTok, there's been this glorification of product management. And I can see why, but at the same time, it's not true at all. Um, a lot of times it's my job is, is arguing with people and telling them why my idea is better than theirs. Not literally, but in a lot of times, yeah, it does really boil down to that. And that's why you see the guy like, you know, trying to fight the dinosaurs and it becomes a game of politics, especially at the bigger companies. But I think the biggest thing is if you are thinking about product and you are thinking about, gosh, what is that next step for me? What does my dream day look like? Like really start super basic and say, am I driven by more of the product I'm building or with the people I work with? I never thought I, I never thought I would work in corporate, but I have a really great team and I really respect the people that I work with that, you know, there's some products that I have to build or have to do that I'm not like super jazzed about, but it's because of the people I work with that I'm like, you know what, we could be working at an insurance company and I'd call it a day. I'd be okay. Because the thing is at the end of the day, I think we have this glorified idea of what it's like and thinking, oh, I'm going to get to do this and I'm going to get to do that. But your day to day becomes very different. And that's why I showed the slide before. What 
the another thing is what are my company deal breakers? It's kind of like dating. What are the things that are the non-negotiable? Do I want a remote work situation? Do I want to be mandated to come back into the office? Do I want unlimited PTO? You know, what is my relationship with my manager look like? How do I want to be challenged? So if we go to the next slide, here's the punchline. The best product managers are the ones that understand how a business works and move up the ladder. What experience will give you that exposure fastest? So I know that maybe there might be some people in the room that are not like product managements for me, but I think this really gets down to the, the biggest piece of advice I can give is that you, you want to have the more experiences you can get under your belt to learn what you want and what you don't want is, allow, is allowing you to have a sharper focus to go after what you could want. And the second thing I would say too, is especially for, every, for anybody that's pivoting in their career right now, is don't let a job define what you're capable of. Like I'm a product manager, for example, like I'm not a VP, I'm not a director, but one of the things I did as like a initial research, when I was doing an conducting initial research for a project I was working on was I outlined like all the products that our team was working on simultaneously to impact a new user, new workflow for our stakeholders. You could say, well, our director could do that or our VP can do that. It doesn't matter. The point is, it's like, if you want to go do, if you're like, well, this is just what I think we should do. No one's going to stop you from actually voicing your opinion or actually saying, hey, here's a new way of looking at this. Does that does that follow with everybody? Like, it's like, hey, if you're like, hey, we should just make this roadmap when really it might be in terms of the lines of someone else's responsibility. No one's going to stop you from that. And I think that's at least where I've gotten today is by not overthinking the constructs of the hierarchy in that sort of way, but to show my level of thinking and showing, hey, this is how I think we can solve problems. Um, so with that said, that pretty much concludes my presentation. Um, but thank you so much. Amazing. Uh, any questions for Glow? Questions from the audience? All right, up here. It sounds sorry. It sounds like the people that you work with, you know, is kind of the main motivator behind, particularly if you're handed down a project, you know, that you're not as passionate about as the stakeholders are saying. So, is do you have any advice about when you are looking for a new role, uh, how to gauge, you know, the team that you're working with? When oftentimes the people interviewing you, you know, maybe you only speak to one person from that department sure. and no one that you'll be working with. That's a great question. I think at least when I've interviewed at earlier stage companies, it's a lot easier to say, hey, can I actually just set up one-on-ones with different people on the team? Because the teams are a lot smaller. Um, with corporate, for me, I was personally referred. Um, so I was able to actually spend time with the person who referred me who knew my team pretty well and kind of pick her brain about it. And so that was that was really helpful. But I think the thing is, if you if you're able to like actually just have like an ally or even just contact someone in that might be in your immediate team, even on LinkedIn, or you can just even ask the hiring manager, like, hey, I would love to just chat informally with some of the people. No one, I don't think, would ever say no to that. If you just want, you want to almost do your due diligence, so that's what I'd recommend. Other questions? Uh, yeah, on the hiring front, how would you go about finding a, a great PM to be the first PM at a startup? Oh, gosh, that's a great question. Um, I think... I think it's in an early stage startup, it's really about passion for that product and expertise around that product. Like as in, do you have that? It's it's kind of having that trifecta of, yeah, you want to have some technical skills, like as in, yes, I know how to take an idea and ship something. But really then it comes down to do, what expertise or competitive advantage does my perspective bring to that industry? And then also that aspect of passion, like as in, will I, will I justify the time that it, to work on at 8 p.m. on a Friday. And the biggest thing that I say to people is that who, who want to jump into corporate is I said, look, if you are young and hungry and have yet to experience all the aspects of a business, go work at a startup first and justify why you're going to spend all these hours like a 10 p.m. on a Friday or working on a Sunday or even a Saturday or working seven day weeks, because if you're not there, then something doesn't get done. Look, if I die tomorrow, WBD will still exist. I know I'm not worried. So then I have a little bit of peace of mind of like, this can wait until tomorrow. Um, I hope that answers your question a little bit. Question? Um, yeah. I, I, first, I just want to say that I've also worked at startups in Warner Brothers and I see you. Um, this is amazing. I'm curious. I, I've interviewed a lot of 
people who describe themselves as product managers, who are really project managers or program oh managers. What yeah. are the key differentiators? Like, what are the things that I can do to help people see what I see in them and sort of like their their ability or inability to like do a real product manager type role. I'm so glad you brought this question up. So one of my biggest fears when I took this job was that I was going to be a feature factory worker. Um, I hate project management. I suck at project management. And I think the thing is, is as a project manager, your job is about delegation and understanding all the nuances. Like when is this going to get done and how is it going to get done? Um, and so I think the biggest thing about product management is really understanding the business value about what you're building and why, and being able to communicate that effectively with stakeholders, but have them understand too. Like as a product manager, it's my job to make sure the designer I'm working with understands, or I've given them the resources or have conversations with them to explain the business value. Like one of the things that I'm trying to do right now as I improve my product documentation when I'm explaining an idea is rolling up all the stakeholders involved in the OKRs to show here's the value here. Let's just get this all out in the open. What are your KPIs and how is this problem or how is the solution going to actually help drive that impact? So to answer your question, I would say the difference between product management and project management is project management is the facilitation of the execution of something. It's kind of like the, the, the way I like to say is it's like building a house. The product manager is the one working with the developer and saying, they're like, yeah, we need to keep it under this budget and we need it shipped by this time and we need it to be three stories high. And you're taking in all those, those requirements like from a stakeholder, right? And then what your job is to figure out, okay, well, how could we feasibly do this? Like what, how, how high would the ceilings be and how tall would it be? And what would be the layout and justifying why it needs to be that way? Then a project manager comes in and, and will say, okay, well, I can get these construction workers for you. And then you would be working out and saying, oh, I need these types of windows. They would be the one to go find it for you and say, oh, I'm going to find someone to actually put it in that place. And so what they're doing is kind of executing your vision. But as a product manager, it's your job to really be the one that understands the nuts and bolts of the business value of what you're building and why. Does that answer the question? Perfect. Great. So thank you so much for everyone. I think we're at time for this session. Um, a round of applause for both of our speakers. <laughs> awesome. And we will conclude product assembly required here. Thank you. All right.